There's an old adage about one having the patience of Job. As I was preparing for this homily, I certainly did not have that degree of patience. You know, there, there are some Sundays when I look at the scripture readings and I try to figure out how they all go together and I just don't get it. Well, this was one of those Sundays. First reading, a reading from the book of Job that Tony read. Here it is today, followed by Paul's letter to the Corinthians and then St. Mark's Gospel. And I just could not find the connecting tissue. At least for most of the Friday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then suddenly, it started to come together. So I don't know if it's going to work. But let me share some of that thinking. Um, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Job. I know Chip did in a discussion earlier this week and actually sat down and read it. I've tried a number of times on a number of occasions, and I get the, to about the middle of chapter 12, 12 out of 40, and I just get exhausted. And then I start skipping ahead to get to the end. I think one source of having the patience of Job is that's what you have to have just to get through this book. The Jewish scriptures, however, view this book as one of the wisdom books. The wisdom books typically contain some kind of deep lesson about the divinity or about virtue. And there are six others besides this one that are in the Septuagint. That's the Latin church's version of the Old Testament. <clears throat> the others are the Psalms, although not all of the Psalms are considered wisdom texts. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, you know what I'm saying. The Song of Songs, sometimes known as the Song of Solomon, the Book of Wisdom itself, and the Book of Sirach, also known as Ecclesiastes. This book of Job is mostly written in parallel lines, which suggests it's actually a poem, and therefore full of allegory. But it obviously has a lesson, as a wisdom book, that it's trying to teach us. So Job was a really great guy. He did all the right things to serve God and do good, and he was very, very, very prosperous. I mean, the passage is going to detail about how many camels he owned and how many sheep he owned and how many cows he owned, all in the thousands. And it tells how many servants he had and how many children he had. And as the book says, he was the greatest man among all in the East. Then there's this little scene where the angels come to God. They meet with God. And among them is Satan. Now, you might say, how does the devil, the exact opposite of God, the personification of evil, just stroll up and meet with God? You would think it's kind of like energy and non-energy, they cancel each other out or something like that. Well, at this point in history and in the development of theology, this concept of the devil as the personification of evil had not yet developed. Instead, the figure presented here is actually known as the Satan. It appears in the Tanakh. The Satan is a member of the sons of God and is a subordinate of Yahweh. And he has a role to play. He is the tempter. A sort of heavenly prosecutor who prosecutes the nation of Judah in the heavenly court, and he tests the loyalty of Yahweh's followers. It's the Satan that is there in the Garden of Eden, Eden, tempting Eden, the tempter, not what we consider to be the devil. So God says to Satan, hey, what have you been up to? 
Satan responds, I've just been strolling around the earth, gone from here to there. It actually says that. I've been strolling around the earth, gone here, gone there. And then the Lord says to Satan, hey, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So the tempter says, well, maybe the only reason why he's so blameless and upright, so God-fearing and good, is because you've allowed him to prosper. Who wouldn't like that? But what if his fortunes were, you know, reversed? And here's the quote. He surely will curse you to your face if that happens. So God takes him up on it and allows the Satan to tempt Job by removing all that he has. Only his life must be spared. Satan gleefully goes forward and begins to destroy Job. Messenger after messenger after messenger comes to Job and tells him how this group has killed all of your camels, and this group has killed all of your cows, and this group has killed all of your sheep. And another messenger comes in and says there was a great quake, and it struck the land, destroying the house where your kids were, and now all of them are dead. One calamity after another befalls Job, but Job does not curse God for his face. Instead, he prays. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And when this doesn't break Job, Satan goes out and afflicts Job with painful sores and fevers from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Even his wife says to him, Are you still remaining with your integrity? Curse God and die at least. Be out of your misery. Job says, you are talking like a foolish man. Shall we accept the good from God, but not the trouble? Then, Job's three friends show up. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They decide to visit him to comfort him in his affliction. And they're there for a couple of days. And after a while, Job in his agony doesn't curse God, but curses the day he was born. One by one of these friends come up with all manner of theories about what's going on. In each case, they see the calamities as God's punishment for something John Job must have done, or that his kids must have done. But Job knows none of this is true. Job knows he has been faithful to God, even now. Eventually, however, Job begins to question, to quote, unquote, speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Maybe it is something I did. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the plans of the wicked? In Job's mind, blessings are rewards for leading a good life. And curses and bad things are rewards for leading evil, evil lives. And Job knows that he's been good, so why is he being crushed like this? Then a fourth visitor shows up, a young man by the name of Eliud, son of Barakel, the Buzite. He asks if there actually is anything we really can do here that affects God. He says, if you sin now, how does that affect the Lord? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? Does it diminish him? And if you're righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness only affects humans like yourself, and your righteousness only other people. But Job must be really confused. He continues to ask, what did he do to deserve this punishment? And as we heard in today's reading, Job is in deep despair over the sheer pointlessness and hopelessness of his life. 
left hanging in the wind. No hope of ever seeing happiness again. And just then, just then, God's voice burst from a cloud. Who are you? Who are you that obscures my plans with words without any knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Like, who, who are you to question me as God? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? If so, tell me. Yet tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. You're so smart. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstones while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Goes, God goes on for 147 verses, asking if Job was there, <clears throat> and whether or not he understood how and why God brought about all things. He had sent the rains to make the earth fertile. Did he keep motherly watch over the birth of a mountain goat or teach the eagles to fly? Eagles to fly? Notice God doesn't give Job an answer to why bad things are happening. And that's the big question, isn't it? Why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do good things happen to bad people? The question of why innocent people suffer has been the most direct challenge to the power and goodness of God. In fact, it's called the problem of evil. Why does it exist? It goes like this. If God can't stop evil, then God is not as all-powerful as God says he is, and therefore he's not God. And if God can stop evil but doesn't, then God's a monster. God says that my enormous design includes the possibility of bad things. Then he simply implies it's a pattern that's part of the way things are. I mean, when the lamb is being devoured by the lion in the wild, it's bad for the lamb, but it's very good for the lion. There are reasons for everything in the grand design. That's just the way it, it is. At least that's what seems to be the message here. But I think that what is revealed here, however, is much deeper, much deeper reality. Namely, that our interactions with God are not transactions. That's how the pagans did things. Kill three pigeons before the idol, and the God had to grant your wish. That's how our commercial world works, right? Act now, for a limited time only, do one good deed and get two blessings free. Shipping and handling, not food. If you've heard these preachers that promulgate what some call the prosperity gospel, you know, you know what that sounds like. Expect a blessing. Operators are standing by to take your prayer request. Visa, Discover, MasterCard, and Glad, and accept. Give me this, and you get that. The wisdom of the book of Job is that Yahweh is not like this. Yahweh creates freedom, gives freedom, loves freely, and desires to be loved freely in return, and not because there's a big prize at the end. That sounds so obvious, it is so easy to forget. Believing that we're entitled to what we have, and probably more, we forget. Rather than owning our lives, we owe our lives to God, regardless of how easy or arduous they may be. And as the book of Job ends, Job realizes that his relationship with God is its own reward. And God, in the end, restores all of Job's prosperity. And after this encounter with the living God who keeps a watchful eye over all creation, Job has a new perspective. By hearsay, I had heard of you, but now my eyes have really seen you. He had been moved from a strict tit-for-tat orientation to an open relationship with God. It turns out that personal calamity is not punishment after all, but it's an invitation to discover our inner spirit and strength. It's an opportunity to deepen our faith 
and focus on what ultimately matters. matters. And it's a window to see blessing in whatever comes our way. A call to deepening our faith and see life as a gift. A chance to rise above our little challenges by proving, providing services to others. The book of Job is about one man's journey into true, lasting happiness. And that is why God knew he would prevail, prevail in the test. He would win against the Satan. Just as surely as fire transforms ore into hard metal, adversity transforms our human frailty into holiness. Calamity, my friends, is the birthplace of saints. That's essentially the lesson of the gospel. As Jesus begins his ministry and comes into the house of Simon and Andrew, he is told about Simon's mother-in-law who is sick with fever. Jesus immediately, instinctively, and gratuitously goes to her and heals her. And she's, she's so insignificant that Mark doesn't even give her a name. She's not rich and, and prosperous like Job. Yet God heals her out of the generosity of his love. And what is her response? She immediately and instinctively and gratuitously gets up and serves them. In fact, the word used by Mark for her service is diakoneo. That's the source of our word deacon. Deacons, as some of you might know, is a holy order in the church whose job is to serve by proclaiming the gospel and performing manual administrative tours. It's kind of interesting, particularly for us Catholics, not the Sina Catholics, but Roman Catholics, that although the office of deacon has not yet been established in the church, Simon's mother-in-law, a woman, was the first one to fulfill it. And the role model of all role models, of course, is Jesus himself. Soon after healing Simon's mother-in-law, people from all over bring him people who are sick and possessed by demons. Soon the whole town is gathered at the door. He cures and the sick and casts out the demons. The whole time he continues this thing I talked about last week called the Messianic Secret. Not letting, he doesn't want the demons to let people know who he is. Jesus did not need them to give him recognition and praise. He gave them help and freedom from evil out of the goodness of his heart and love for them. Jesus was also expecting that this perfect life would lead to prosperity and earthly, and earthly happiness. He was not expecting that. No, Jesus in fact had a date with the cross. He shows us that the quality of one's life is not measured by how much ease and how much how many finite things one accumulates on earth, but on how one spends that life in the service of God and others. Doing good things and serving God and others does not lead to prosperity and worldly goodness. Doing good things and serving God are rewards in themselves. Service is the only appropriate response to God in our life. Service given as freely as God's creative and salvific act is given to us. And as St. Paul says in that letter to the Corinthians, there is no recompense to what witnessing to the gospel. Rather, I have been made myself a slave to all so as to win as many as possible over to God. That doesn't sound like a comfortable life. That doesn't sound like prosperity. But that, my friends, is exactly what we are called. So, that's how these things came together in my head. I hope it made some sense. You see, it's what we do with our lives here that matters. Not how comfortable those lives are. Perhaps it's actually how uncomfortable they are. It's how we use our lives to serve God and our neighbors, that is our call. So, as we continue this liturgy, 